That we can go really far, we can go really fast, we can do many different roles. We can carry up to 24 passengers fully loaded for, in a, for a combat role and put them into a zone and we can be out of the zone extremely quickly. Those kind of uh, missions that are unique to um, rotorcraft vice fixed wing uh, aircraft and I think that in particular is what excites me about tilt rotor because in tilt rotor you're getting the best of both worlds. The opponents of the V-22 I think never quite gave it credit for is that it, it's not really a helicopter that can fly fast, it's an airplane that can land and take off vertically. In a dusty corner of a museum in Somerset, England, lie the last remains of what was seen as the future of aviation in the 1950s. The Fairy Rotodyne was a compound rotorcraft featuring the characteristics of a helicopter, autogyro and fixed wing aircraft. A tipjet powered rotor allowed the aircraft to take off and land vertically and perform low speed maneuvers. In cruise flight, the main rotor auto-rotated and the engine power drove the two propellers. The Fairy Rotodyne fulfilled a dream held by so many. How do you combine the vertical takeoff and landing attributes of a helicopter with the speed and range advantages of a fixed-wing aircraft? Here's Elfin App Rees, chairman of the Helicopter Museum, which holds the only remaining components of the aircraft. This is the all that survives uh -huh. of the ferry rotodyne. Um, what we've got here is the rotor head and so on, which obviously sat on top of the aircraft, a section through the cabin, and one of the test blades. This is actually not a full-size blade, believe it or not. <laughs> um, but the, the rotodyne was... Uh, um, in many ways a very successful attempt to produce a compound aircraft which could fly London, Paris, London, Brussels as a compound aircraft. The problem really was it was ahead of its time. Um, you know, this blade, for example, is extremely heavy. Um, you know, it takes eight or nine people to lift and carry it because the front end is, you know, is all stainless steel. But the principle was very simple. You didn't need a complicated gearbox, anything like that. You simply took um, air from the engines, which were also driving the propellers, and you ducted it up through the rotor, out to the tips, where you mixed it with fuel. And so you were able to lift off vertically using the rotors, transition to forward flight, switch the tip jets off, and then fly as a conventional aircraft using the propellers um, and until you got to your destination. The rotor's obviously giving a certain amount of lift um, to, 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 you know, so you didn't need full-scale wings. When you got to the other end, you switched the tip jets back on again and then landed vertically. And we've certainly, we've had people come here and look at the, you know, the, the rotor head assembly and so on um, because they were interested in developing it. So, you know, the basics of it are all there. Um, and certainly using modern materials where you'd save a lot of the weight um, and being able to use modern avionics and modern technology. I mean, the computers that they had for this aircraft were very, very basic, to say the least. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, as a principle, it's very, very real. Welcome to Shepard Studios Revolutions in Vertical Flight, brought to you in partnership with Bell. Over the course of six episodes, we are looking at the history of vertical flight and discover the key pioneers and revolutionary moments that created the rotorcraft industry we know today. And we consider the future revolutions, how next generation rotorcraft will shape the future battle space and hear how innovation underway today will enable the urban air mobility of tomorrow. Initially, the British Fairy Rotodyne concept looked very promising, and there were even plans to build a larger 75-seat version for commercial transport. But due to a combination of politics at the time and a lack of firm commercial orders, the project was cancelled in 1962. The dream of fast, long-range VTOL aircraft would have to wait for several more decades. 
Step forward, the tilt rotor. The tilt rotor configuration overcomes one of the most significant factors limiting the maximum forward speed of a helicopter. Where the aerodynamic phenomenon known as retreating blade stall provides an unbreakable speed limit. This is Richard Whittle, author of The Dream Machine, the untold history of the notorious V-22 Osprey. The, um, the idea of the tilt rotor, one of the things that I wrote about in my book, which uh, fascinated me, is the fact that the tilt rotor, this aircraft that has two big rotors on its wingtips that, that swivel up to fly like a helicopter and forward to fly like an airplane, uh, is a dream actually that went back to the 1930s, almost to the beginning, the beginnings of uh, rotorcraft, when uh, when people kept looking for a way to combine vertical and uh, vertical f- takeoff and landing with horizontal flight, which is a very very difficult proposition. And we, and you know, in the book, I I sort of tell the history of the convertiplane as it was originally called, <clears throat> and. Uh, it started out, there was the XV-3 convertiplane, which uh, Bell did with, um, actually the Army was most interested in the tilt rotor among the military services to start with. Uh, and then there was the XV-15 tilt rotor, which was done with the Army and NASA. And uh, And in the 70s, the Marine Corps started looking for a replacement for its uh, CH-46 uh, helicopters, uh, troop carrying helicopters, which were the primary means in those days of getting Marines ashore from amphibious landing ships, and they had since the end of World War II that uh, that they needed more speed, and uh, and so Navy Secretary John Lehman, who was himself a helicopter pilot, uh, saw the XV-15 tilt rotor fly at the 1981 Paris Air Show and decided the Marines had to have a tilt rotor. It was the failure of Operation Eagle Claw that set the Pentagon squarely on the path towards the tilt rotor. The lack of coordination inherent in the mission led to the establishment of US Special Operations Command, while low-level helicopter night flying became the preserve of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, the legendary Night Stalkers. Yeah, well, you, you, you put your finger on, on one of the most important events in the V-22's history and one of the most important events in recent American military history. Um, uh, Operation Eagle Claw, of course, was this very complicated plan to rescue um, 53 Americans who were being held hostage in Iran and had been for six months since the Islamic Revolution that overthrew America's ally, the Shah. The failure also highlighted the need for a new type of aircraft that could not only take off and land vertically, but also could carry combat troops and do so at speed. The Department of Defense forged ahead with the Joint Service Vertical Takeoff and Landing Experimental Program, or JVX Aircraft Program, in 1981, then under US Army leadership. With this project, the Pentagon had set off down the long road towards the V-22 Osprey, today the world's only in-service tilt rotor. Spivey and some of his colleagues at Bell put together a briefing after this disaster at Desert One that showed how it could have been accomplished in a single night. So that that briefing uh, remained very important uh, through the through the history of the battle over the V-22. And in fact, um, after 2000, when the V-22 had two very bad crashes and um, a blue ribbon commission of experts was formed to evaluate the program and see whether the Marines and, the, and whether the military actually should continue with the V-22 concept, <laughs> the final report actually cited the same thing. It, it said there was no evidence the V-22 concept is fundamentally flawed. And it said, as an example, the Desert One mission involved two days of hiding in the desert, a mission that could have been carried out by a V-22-like aircraft in a single period of darkness. Uh, the the Desert One disaster, which also, of course, had many, many uh, um, effects on the future of the U.S. military, uh, among them an emphasis on joint operations. Uh, the, but that that mission 
uh, was a critical event in the history of the V-22. Once the JVX program was underway, Bell Helicopter, which had previously developed two tilt rotor demonstrators, partnered with Boeing Vertol to submit a proposal based on an enlarged version of the Bell XV-15 prototype. A preliminary design contract was awarded on the 26th of April, 1983. While the tilt rotor configuration was somewhat proven, the design challenges were daunting, particularly given the number of missions the aircraft would have to undertake, as well as the need for it to operate from US Navy ships. So, uh, the V-22 looks the way it does because it, it, there were a number of trade-offs that had to be made, uh, ones that upset uh, actually the chief tilt rotor designer at Bell, and what initially the V-22 was supposed to be uh, was a joint program in which the aircraft would be designed to do 10 different missions for four different military services. You know, and its main mission was to carry Marines, uh, as many as 24 uh, combat-loaded troops. Uh, but it was, it was also supposed to do all the other transport missions of a CH-46 helicopter that, that the Marines flew or the uh, Sikorsky CH-53D helicopter the, Marines Corps flew, uh, the Marine Corps flew. And for the Air Force, the V-22 was going to be used for special operations missions, which it is today. And for the Air Force and Navy both, the V-22 was supposed to be a combat search and rescue aircraft. And then the Army also wanted the V-22 to do this pretty exotic uh, electronic intelligence mission. And, and the requirements for that mission, he said... The, the aircraft had to be able to cruise at 30,000 feet, but, which is well above the, where you need oxygen, but evade surface-to-air missiles by diving toward the Earth at a descent rate of 20,000 feet per minute or more, while doing a split-ass maneuver and dispensing chaff and flares, and then fly nap of the Earth, in other words, low level. And, uh, the, and that, you know, is, is quite... Um, an, almost an aerobatic thing for a cargo aircraft like this to do. And then it says, uh, and, and then the Osprey was also supposed to carry guns and air to air missiles, and it was supposed to have external hard points for extra fuel tanks and electronic countermeasures. The original design was supposed to be this really quite complicated aircraft, but, but even for the Marine Corps, uh, one of the problems was that they wanted an aircraft that would carry as many troops as a CH-46, uh, and they wanted it to fit on um, a Tarawa-class amphibious assault ship, an LHA, because amphibious assault has always been the Marine Corps' primary mission. Today, the performance of the V-22 is unrivaled for a VTOL aircraft. It can carry 24 troops or up to 20,000 pounds of internal cargo. Its max cruise speed is 266 knots, and it can travel 880 nautical miles without refueling. But it's no exaggeration to say that as a child, the V-22 had a difficult upbringing. During testing from 1991 to 2006, there were four crashes, resulting in 30 fatalities. These incidents, as well as cost increases over the original budget, led the V-22 programme to attract headlines with adjectives such as troubled, controversial or even worse. Richard Whittle describes this period as the Dark Ages, when the programme was at threat of being cancelled several times. And then in 2005, um, all, when all that testing was done and they were ready to start uh, the, the steps necessary to put the V-22 in service. Um, I, I knew that, that they felt they were out of trouble when they invited me and a bunch of other reporters to come down to uh, North Carolina and ride on the V-22. So uh, I figured, I figured if, they, uh, if they thought there was any risk, they wouldn't be inviting us. And, uh... Despite its difficult start in life, the V-22 was declared operational with the U.S. Marine Corps in 2007 and with the U.S. Air Force two years later. In October 2019, it was announced that the fleet of 375 Ospreys in service in the U.S. Air Force, Marine Corps and Navy had surpassed the 500,000 flight hour mark. I don't think I ever thought, will, will it reach 500 operational hours? But it did seem like it was a program that was perhaps doomed to failure. 
until I flew in it in, in, in 2005. And <laughs> I, I wrote a piece for the Dallas Morning News at the time, that I, and I, I think my lead said something like, I thought I'd be retired before this would happen. Uh, and and I, I was in the first uh, stick of reporters, as they, uh, as they call the, the group of uh, passengers. And um, the, the pilot was a young uh, lieutenant colonel at the time named Chris Seymour, call sign Mongo. And uh, we get in the aircraft and strap in, and, and uh, you know, it started to take off, and it felt a little bit like a helicopter. And then suddenly, he tilts the nose of the aircraft up, and as I wrote at the time, it felt like you were in a Corvette sports car that had been floored. The, 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 pro- the big prop rotors, uh, when they're tilted forward, they have an immense amount of power, and um, and one of the things that I liked about it was during the ride, which where he, he put us through like a T two two G turn to sort of throw your back up against the wall, and and then he hovered over a grassy area and put the aircraft down and took off again and did a sort of a pirouette and then and then came back and landed and. Uh, uh, one of the things you notice about it immediately, if you've ever ridden in military helicopters, is how how you don't have the vibration. Uh, the, the noise is pretty much the same uh, because these aircraft are not um, insulated against noise. Uh, but you don't have the vibration you have in a helicopter where you have the rotor overhead. Because of this inherent lack of vibration when compared to a helicopter, Rittle says people should not regard the V-22 as a helicopter that can fly fast. It should be regarded instead as an aeroplane that can land and take off vertically. The old joke is that a helicopter is just um, a collection of thousands of parts flying in close formation. And so the, uh, the, vi- the vibration is usually pretty, um, uh, pretty significant uh, in a military helicopter. And there was none of that in the V-22. It was a very smooth ride, very fast ride. The V-22 uh, was a smooth ride in comparison uh, in, in airplane mode, and, uh, and and that's one of the one of the things that the the opponents of the V-22 I think never quite uh, gave it credit for is that it's it's not really a, a helicopter that can fly fast. It's an airplane that can land ver- and take off vertically. And so you get uh, the benefits of the V-22 from the fact that it, that it is an airplane uh, more than you get the benefit of uh, vertical takeoff and landing. And of course, the V-22 itself can't hover as efficiently as a helicopter can, and it's big. But that's why Bell has designed under something called the Joint Multi-Role Technology Demonstration Program a new tilt rotor, a smaller tilt rotor. Um, I think it's designed to carry maybe 11 troops um, called the V-280, and the 280 stands for the fact that it's meant to fly 280 um, knots uh, speed, which is, I think, in the neighborhood of twice as fast as as the best military helicopters go. Um, And they have tried to learn from the, the, uh, I want to call them design difficulties, if not design flaws of the V-22. So the V-22 is, is the first operational tilt rotor. Uh, I expect there will be more. In the 1960s, there was this um, V-stall wheel of aircraft and propulsion concepts, which unfortunately is often called the V-stall wheel of misfortune. This is Mike Hersheberg, the executive director of the Vertical Flight Society. In uh, 1995, when I was working for the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office, we updated that to include the Joint Strike Fighter contenders. And so I did a lot of research on the background and history of of these different concepts. Um, I wrote a number of articles. I did a series of 20 technical papers looking at the history of of V-stall development around the world, both jet-borne propellers, rotors, and everything. On the V-stall wheel, there's 45 different aircraft that are classified, and at the time, there were only, you know, two two concepts that ever actually went into production. That was the Harrier, and then the Soviets had the, the Forger, the Yak-38. Um, so it was sort of like looking at all these attempts, including tilt rotors, 
and nothing was really successful, which is why I got the unfortunate moniker of East All Wheel of, of Misfortune. But some of the different lessons learned are, you know, there are limitations, uh, operational capability limitations uh, that you have to either overcome or, or live with from something that takes off and lands uh, vertically. So you have a lot of downwash. Uh, the V-22 has certainly seen that. Um, it takes a, an incredible amount of power. So if there's any way else that you can that you can do your operations, a short takeoff or just longer runways, uh, you're always going to get more. You're always going to get more range and payload if you can take off with a wing. So helicopters are limited. Uh, they're they're great at what they do, um, but they're limited in in range and speed and and payload because they're thrusting downwards the whole time. The V-22 is really a result of the 50-some years of technology development before it's before it became operationally um, before it became operational. Uh, so it's the advanced turbine engines uh, that had the high power. Uh, it's the um, solving a lot of the problems with the, the rotating nacelles, um, just normal aircraft development uh, issues. Uh, so the Marines are able to have a laser focus on what they want, and that's why they have the most advanced uh, vertical flight aircraft of any uh, any service or anybody in the world. So you look at the V-22, the CH-53K King Stallion, the F-35B Lightning. Uh, Lightning. So they've got the they've got the most advanced um, uh, aircraft in the world. Now some of that's because they don't have to buy as many because they're much smaller, so they can afford to put more money into the development and the acquisition costs because having having one really high performance machine is seen as being better and cheaper and uh, more capable than having multi than having different types of aircraft for different missions. Scott Drennan is Bell's vice president of innovation. His first job at the company was working on the V-22, and he remembers the engineering team's excitement about the tilt rotor's potential. My first program was the V-22, and the V-22 is a transformational innovation uh, across the whole aerospace industry. I mean, at the time, we were still in the EMD portion of the program, and we all know there were some growing pains involved with that, um, as, as there often are with innovations. Uh, but now, when you look at what's happening today with the V-22, it's just transformed all the concept of operations for the, for the military, in particular the Marine Corps. And we look forward to having our next generation tilt rotor do the same thing for the Army. The, what happens with engineering teams that have been thinking about uh, these, these products and these technologies prior to them actually becoming something that the customer is using, we get overly excited about it because we're we're into the details and and you're looking at the vehicle saying wow it really does go twice as far twice as fast and gosh you know look at the the lift capacity that it has maybe it can do these other three missions as well as just that generic notion of twice as far twice as fast and um, so you get excited about that you know that it's special you know that it's transformational and then you're just trying to make that connection between you and the customer, and the Marines were great about that. And then you're just trying to make sure that you're, you're not getting too far ahead of yourself. It, what you're working on is leading edge, but it has to have the safety and the tech, not technical integrity that, that good engineers bring to any project that they're on. So you try to keep that in check a little bit, but it, it's hard to not be really excited about knowing what, what, what this is going to do for the future. And we knew that at the time. Well, one of the things that excites me about as a former Navy helicopter pilot and test pilot about rotorcraft is um, the ability to land and take off in unprepared zones. Essentially, you're not restricted to runways. This is Colin Smith, who is Director of Military Business Development at Bell. And so the ability to do that and be able to hover and um, perform missions that you couldn't otherwise do with a uh, aircraft because you have the ability for low, slow flight um, is, um, you know, an additional capability that, that I think is fun. Also, many of the helicopters are crew oriented too, as opposed to some of the aircraft that, that you might think of from a from a jet jet uh, perspective. 
Um, so I like those two things about rotorcraft. The other in the interface you might have with hoisting passengers in and out of the, the helicopters or doing some of those those kind of uh, missions that are unique to um, rotorcraft vice fixed wing uh, aircraft. And I think that in particular is what excites me about tilt rotor. Because in tilt rotor you're getting the best of both worlds. You need the capability to, to hover and, and um, take off like a, like a rotorcraft and execute those uh, missions and then you have the range and speed to get to where you uh, need to go to do the next rotorcraft uh, type type mission, so you're kind of getting the best of uh, both world, worlds with a tilt rotor uh, aircraft. So you're kind of bridging the gap between like an H60 and a C130 cargo plane or something similar, similar to that. For the Bell Boeing partnership that produces the Osprey, the tilt rotor has been a significant revenue stream over the past decade. The most recent multi-year contract announced in July 2018 was worth $4.2 billion and takes production out to 2024. Yeah, well, the V-22 program has been extremely important to Bell. I mean, that's the, I think, at the uh, core of Bell's uh, sales has been the development of tilt rotor aircraft, right? We're the first ones to bring um, tilt rotor, first ones, uh, uh, you know, developmentally from the XV-3 through the XV-15 to the V-22. And now we have the first military operated uh, tilt rotor that's uh, been fielded. And of course, then the V280 uh, has gone through its initial uh, demonstration, uh, technical demonstration for the uh, Army. We're looking forward to supporting the Army, Marine Corps, and then hopefully even the other services with the um, uh, Navy and the, maybe even the Air Force with the V280 or a derivative of the V280. So, tilt rotor evolution continues, and I think um, that's, uh, that's exciting for Bell because we're the company that's been able to do that. I think one of the important things about not only is surpassing 500,000 hours, but it's also uh, um, combat proven. A lot of those hours are combat proven, and there are a lot of lives that were saved because of the hours of V-22 their traditional helicopter uh, could not provide, both in the combat search and rescue and the personnel recovery um, uh, roles. Basically, they were able to go, um, you know, conduct missions, and then if when they took fire. Uh, if people were wounded, they were able to get those um, people back to medical support faster so that they save their lives. And at longer ranges, they were able to respond to uh, calls for assistance to um, bring people out that wouldn't have necessarily been saved with a helicopter. Or the helicopter couldn't have um, gotten there in time or didn't have the range to go get them. So. Um, I think that's an important thing of those 500,000 hours about what the aircraft is actually accomplishing uh, during that time. And it's definitely changing the way the warfighter fights, like we talked about earlier, and saving people's lives. So. After not initially committing to the purchase of the tilt rotor, the US Navy ordered 39 V-22s in June 2018. Designated the CMV-22, the U.S. Navy variant will be used for the carrier onboard delivery role. This will be similar to the MV-22, but include an extended range fuel system, a high-frequency radio, and a public address system. So from a, from a Navy capability point of view, and this Navy's getting ready to receive its first uh, aircraft here in fiscal year 20 will deliver that capability to the Navy and then they will um, have initial operational capability in 2021 with their first deployment and the Navy is going to use it to replace the carrier on board delivery aircraft which is the current C2 aircraft. It will fundamentally change for the Navy about how it could do uh, logistics operations. So right now the Navy is looking at it as a one for one replacement maybe but there are some people who have uh, their mind open to how the V-22 might be used differently to expand the way logistics is supported to the Navy. So right now, uh, logistics is going from the shore to the carrier, and then from the carrier, it's being dispersed to the other small ships and, and other locations in the fleet that it needs to go to. But a V-22 could go point to point uh, for the Navy. So it could go to the supply ship instead of the carrier. It could go from a supply ship to the, to the carrier. And it could do that at the extended ranges that a V-22 offers. So in a theater, which is very important for the Navy, like the Pacific, um, now you have an um, increased logistics net that you could throw down from an air, airborne point of view over top of um, the surface assets for uh, ships that are out there for the Navy. So I think it's going to be extremely important for them. Um, the Navy variant 
uh, compared to the Marine Corps variant. It does also get increased range for the Navy because of its uh, missions in theaters like the Pacific and that extended range it needs at sea instead of going from just uh, ship, to, uh, ship to shore like the Marines or from shore to shore. Uh, that extended range at sea, it, get, it should be able to go 1,150 nautical miles is the uh, range that the Navy wants to get out of the uh, platform, uh, which compares to about 1,000 miles for the CV-22 uh, variant, and then about 800 nautical miles for the Marine Corps variant. Those are all uh, rough figures. So it'll have um, slightly larger sponsons when you look at it visually. The side, the, the, side, the side sponsons will be slightly larger, and it'll have uh, additional uh, wing tanks inside the wing to carry the additional uh, fuel that's required for that. Um, it'll also have a beyond the line side of rate line of sight radio, so HF uh, radio that allow it to talk at extended ranges like you need uh, in the uh, ocean environments. Uh, and then it'll also have um, a public address system because part of the mission for the Navy is carrying passengers to and from the, the ship. So those are three three main things and the major things that are different for the Navy platform than the uh, other platforms. but very excited in particular about how the Navy might be able to operate the platform and once they start using it um, in 2021 uh, then you know maybe there's they'll um, consider hey other missions that they might be able to to use it for in the future and then long term uh, the Navy's looking at um, at some point replacing the H-60s that has on board its ships with um, future vertical lift aircraft I think those evolutions are what excite me about it, and that's why I'm excited for the U.S. Navy to get its first tilt rotor aircraft and then understand how the Navy could change its uh, operations at sea doctrinally um, because right now it's got a web of helicopters running around inside the strike group and a little bit extended from the strike group, um, conducting the various missions from anti-submarine warfare to surface warfare to general logistics support but fundamentally it's constrained that bubble is constrained by the the range of a traditional helicopter and then now when the u.s navy gets uh tilt rotor technology um into their fleet now they're going to understand they can make that bubble wider for the carrier strike group in its um you know sphere of influence so those are the kind of things that excite me when i look at it from a from a military um operator point of view the Bell Boeing partnership is now looking to extend the production of the V-22 further through additional international sales after securing its first foreign customer, Japan, which is purchasing 17 Ospreys. Yeah, so for, for uh, V-22 and our, our, foreign, our allies and foreign military partners out there, um, there is a lot of interest for the V-22 and what um, Till Rotor could bring to their militaries as well and in particular um, those countries which are getting the joint strike f fighter are um, considering v v22 um, is a capability that in particular for the u.s navy and one of the reasons why the u.s navy is getting the aircraft is that it can um, internally carry the engine power module for the joint strike fighter and this important logistics support capabilities to so some of those uh, countries like the uh, United Kingdom who are getting a joint strike fighter and they have their Queen Elizabeth ship this might be a capability that they uh, value for them so they um, uh, in fact the V-22s have done operations uh, with the uh, UK and landed on their ships uh, a few other countries that we've um, our military in the U.S. has conducted um, uh, landings with as well as the uh, the French and the Japanese, of course, are our one current uh, military customer. So there's been V-22 operations off those ships, and, the, and Japan is going to get 17 of those aircraft, and their pilots are training with the U.S. Marine Corps na uh, now at uh, New River with their aircraft in, in New River, North Carolina. So I think... Um, there's a lot of uh, potential for V-22 to expand uh, around the world with its uh, capability from, for our foreign uh, uh, allies and, uh, and nations. The presence of a tilt rotor within its ranks has undoubtedly revolutionized the way the US military conducts business. For the US Marine Corps in particular, having an aircraft like the V-22 tilt rotor as a replacement for the CH-46 tandem helicopter has been a game changer. Here's Corporal Michael Knox with VMM 263. 
The MV22's greatest strengths that separate it from all the other platforms in the Marine Corps is that we can go really far, we can go really fast, we can do many different roles. We can carry up to 24 passengers fully loaded for, in a, for a combat role and put them into a zone and we can be out of the zone extremely quickly. We can pull people that are injured, we can take them and we can get them to a hospital extremely quickly. So if there's something time critical such as there's a high priority target in a village or a city somewhere far away and we need to get there yesterday, a V-22 will get there much faster than any other helicopter in the military. Fundamentally, the MV-22 for the U.S. Marine Corps uh, was a large change. So when they were flying the uh, CH-46, which was their ship-to-shore movement, which is fundamentally what the Marine Corps is about, is bringing that uh, naval force from the ship and, and bringing it ashore, they were limited in range to approximately 50 nautical miles. And so they wanted to expand that capability for the uh, mar uh, Marine Force with their amphibious ships to be farther uh, out of harm's way back into the littoral areas and the uh, tilt rudder uh, technology and the V-22 in particular uh, provides them the extended range that they need to get from a ship that's farther off the uh, beach and then the increase in speed also lets them cover that uh, range in, in the same amount of time or uh, shorter. So fundamentally it's been very much transformational for the uh, Marine Corps and now that the Marine Corps um, has had the aircraft and operated, uh, you know, operating it. Uh, it's been called the most in-demand aircraft for the United States Marine Corps by the Commandant of the uh, Marine Corps. Um, so as, as uh, uh, the Marine Corps continues to use it, it continues to find new ways that it might um, do its uh, missions and develop its uh, doctrine. And I think as the Army looks at V-280, I think they're going to see that their doctrine could change substantially from the limited um, range and sp speed of reaction that a traditional helicopter provides. And if they end up going with tilt rotor for their new future vertical lift platforms, their, their Flora uh, platform, then that could allow them to change the way they do business as well and take advantage of that increased range and speed. So. Um, very important for the Marine Corps from a U.S. Air Force perspective. It's providing a national level asset capability for the Air Force Special Operations Command. So it's able to respond 24-7, um, um, point, point to point, getting uh, what they call troops directly to the X, operators to the X. It's got the uh, range and speed to do that. It's got in-flight refueling capability that allows it to even go, go beyond the, just the one tank of um, gas that it holds internally. And so that's a capability that they didn't have to have before where they would use several different platforms maybe to get the special operators there. Now they can do that with a, with a V-22. And fundamentally it allows them to do uh, continue to do more of their missions in uh, one space of night operations. For AFSOC, a lot of the genesis of it was out of the Desert One mission into Iran, right? So that that would have taken, uh, you know, some 33, it took 33 hours to roughly to execute. And now the V-22 can do that same mission within a period of darkness. So it's fundamentally changed our national level capability through the Air Force Special Operations Command about how they operate. We will look at the future of the tilt rotor in military operations next time, in particular Bell's development of its V-280 for the US Army. But Bell's experience with its XV-15 demonstrator and later on the V-22 program also led to the creation of a civil tilt rotor, albeit one Bell is no longer involved in. The project initially started life as a partnership in 1998 between Bell and Italy's Augusta. What was then called the Bell Augusta BA-609 is a twin-engined tilt-rotor VTOL aircraft with a configuration similar to that of the V-22 Osprey. The objective was to provide the civil market with an aircraft capable of landing vertically like a helicopter while having range and speed well in excess of conventional rotorcraft. In particular, the BA-609 was seen as an ideal aircraft for VIP customers and offshore oil and gas operators. But differing opinions about the commercial viability of the project caused Bell to formally withdraw from the programme. The BA-609 became the AW-609.
the Bell Boeing team, who are the, the creators of the V-22 Osprey uh, in the mid-90s, uh, decided to, uh, on the success of that program and the maturation of the technology, that it was time uh, to pivot to the commercial side. Here is William Sunnick, head of Tilt Rotor Marketing at Leonardo. Right, so in 1996, Bell Boeing launched the, the BB-609, right, and, and geared toward introducing this aircraft, this technology rather, into the commercial um, uh, market space. You know, basically the advantage of tilt rotor technology, you know, giving the capability to go uh, far, fast and vertical, right, tilt rotor speed, ranges, uh, altitudes, with the vertical uh, component there in your mission. Uh, we saw the benefits uh, that the military users uh, were having and like a lot of great advancements in aviation that first started on the military side, then wanted to bring that, um, that advantage to the commercial operators. So the Bell Boeing team started in 1996. Um, and around that time is when Bell, or excuse me, Boeing also um, merged with McDonnell Douglas and, and decided to really focus on military rotorcraft. So shortly thereafter in the 1998 time period, um, during the initial design phase, uh, Boeing decided to exit the commercial rotorcraft business, and as part of that, they exited the, the 609 because it is commercial uh, rotorcraft. Uh, so Bell uh, went in search of a new partner. Uh, Bell has had a long-standing relationship with Augusta at the time, uh, mm -hmm. dating back you know, right after um, World War II in, in the early 50s with uh, Bell 47s, right, that uh, Augusta was building over in Italy. So uh, it made a lot of sense, right? And the things that uh, Augusto was working on the time were very, very complimentary. So that relationship was solidified at the end of 1998, the Bell Augusta team and the BA 609. And that relationship continued um, probably about to the latter part of the first decade of um, uh, the 21st century, right? Uh, and at that point, Bell uh, decided it wanted to go in a different direction. And so the uh, Augusta, now Leonardo team, uh, got full ownership of the program in uh, late 2011. So from late 2011 on, Augusta, now Leonardo helicopters, uh, took full ownership of the program. Today, three AW609 prototypes are flying as the company works towards certification with the US FAA. Serial production of the aircraft has also started at Leonardo's Philadelphia final assembly line. Um, well, I'll tell you, for Leonardo, uh, we believed in the capability. We believed in the, the need, right? And you, you look through across uh, history, um, mankind has always wanted to go faster, right? Always wanted to have improvements um, in performance, right? So and for helicopters, Right, we're kind of limited. You know, the speeds haven't really increased appreciably, and then you know, physics and aerodynamics really limit that. Right, uh, the tilt rotor is a very, very efficient um, configuration to allow an increase in speed uh, in a vertical lift platform for commercial use. Uh, along with that, you know, with the 609, it's also a pressurized aircraft. So now we're really starting to fully exploit, you know, the the what I would call the twin turboprop. Uh, configuration of the aircraft, right, when it's flying as a fixed wing aircraft, flying very, very similar to a twin turboprop. So now we're going to be cruising at altitude, right, so 20 to 25,000 feet. Uh, so you're cruising above obstacles, obviously, but also above um, bad weather systems, right, and you're going, you know, directly, you know, point to point, right, without having to go circuitous routes uh, around obstacles or lower altitudes and things like that. Uh, and you also have airspeed advantages at altitude, right? So there's a lot of great dividends now um, by really, really exploiting the configuration. So, and that's, you know, Leonardo uh, saw this and saw the demand from our customers. I'm very, very, very excited right now as, um, as momentum is, is really increasing on the program. Our final, um, our, our final demonstrator aircraft uh, that we have is, it should be doing uh, one of its last ground turns today. Uh, if, if the weather cooperates here, <laughs> it seems the winter is coming early in the east coast of the United States here, so a uh, little bit of a challenge here. But uh, we're, we're wrapping up our final ground test of that aircraft. That is production representative. So that aircraft will demonstrate all the improvements we made to the aircraft um, and really um, uh, just, I think, finalize a lot of things 
you know, with regard to the FAA on this airframe. You know, obviously, it's the airframe has been flying a lot, but what what really hasn't been talked about a lot, um, the program being started some time ago, when we took ownership of the program in late 2011, uh, something that we did, I don't think we talk enough about, is we also did a lot of critical thinking about where the aircraft was in its development. Uh, also, what new emerging systems and technologies were out there, um, as well as the, the type of capability we wanted come time of certification. So we're really at a, a, a crossroads, right? We could have continued with the existing design, but what we did instead was decided to embark upon a whole other development program, really, for this aircraft to really, really uh, inject state-of-the-art technologies and capabilities in the aircraft that have a very, very robust uh, design come time of certification. In February 2018, Leonardo announced that helicopter transport operator ERA Group will be the civil launch customer of the Tilt Rotor. The manufacturer has also signed several other MOUs with helicopter operators to explore civil applications for the AW609. Uh, ERA Helicopters uh, is our launch customer. Uh, I'm excited and we're working closely with them. You know, ERA's got a, a very, very robust portfolio across all the market segments that we're looking at. So VIP, corporate uh, transport, uh, search and rescue and emergency medical services, as well as offshore resource development. So all the missions that we're targeting for, the, uh, for this aircraft, ERA flies. And so I really enjoy working closely with them and they're excited about the capability this aircraft brings to those mission sets. Leonardo has consistently said that it has interest in over 50 aircraft worldwide, but hasn't revealed a definite list price for the aircraft. Mirroring the V-22, the civil tilt rotor has also had a long gestation with certification activities ongoing. Yeah, I, I can't give an exact timeline. But, but I tell you, we're, we're getting close, as I said before, and momentum is rapidly building, and as well as excitement, right? As, you know, introducing world's first commercial tilt rotor, and for the FAA, their first powered lift aircraft. This is a brand new category for them, the first in many, many decades. So as we're chatting before, you know, we've got some big things that we're working, you know, getting this final production representative um, demonstrator flying, which we hope to be very, very soon. Uh, and then our um, full flight simulator, I expect to arrive here in six months. That's a full uh, dome simulator, full motion and whatnot. Our partners at CAE are, are, uh, are uh, putting together right now. So, you know, we are very, very focused uh, on quality and safety here and, and working with our partners, the FAA. And I, I tip my hat to them, right? They've got an awesome responsibility of introducing this brand new category. And so being very, very diligent uh, and certifying the aircraft and, and getting, you know, through this process uh, very methodically. So, but we're excited uh, about the capability the AW609 will introduce and because we're, we're convinced that it will improve lives um, through, you know, the ability to go far, fast and vertical in one aircraft. Leonardo has positioned the civil tilt rotor within the luxury and civil emergency services communities. Once certified, the AW609 will become the first powered lift civil platform to enter the market. Meanwhile, V22 production and upgrades continue, bolstered by new operators, the US Navy and Japan. The future of the tilt rotor as a warfighting machine now centers on Bell Flight's development of the V280 tilt rotor for the US Army's FVL program. Its partner on the V22 program, Boeing, has opted to pursue another rotorcraft configuration entirely for FVL, the coaxial compound. In choosing a replacement for its thousands of Black Hawk helicopters, the US Army faces a choice that will have deep ramifications on the future of the industry. That's next time on Revolutions in Vertical Flight. Revolutions in Vertical Flight is brought to you in partnership with Bell. A huge thanks for their support. Thanks also to the Royal Aeronautical Society, the Vertical Flight Society and the Arthur Young Society for their assistance and access to their archives, as well as to Elfin Apreese and the staff at the Helicopter Museum. In our research, we found the God Machine by James Childs extremely helpful and it's an excellent read. For those wanting to know more about the tilt rotor, go no further than Richard Whittle's excellent book, The Dream Machine. 
Revolutions in Vertical Flight was written and produced by Tony Skinner, with script assistance by Jared Cowan and audio edits by Noemi DiStefano. And I'm your narrator, Jennifer Bequan. Until next time.